Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Tom Kaufman. I'm the library supervisor of the Robert R. Taylor School of Architecture and Construction Science Library. And welcome to my presentation this morning, Historic Tower Clocks and Bells of Alabama. I'd like to thank um, our uh, videographer from Marketing Communications, Stefan Smith, uh, Michael Tullier, the Director of Marketing and Communications, Ms. Juanita Roberts, the Executive Director of Library Services, and uh, Interim Dean uh, Rod Fluker of the uh, School of Architecture and Construction Science. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning with you, and I'm very, um, very excited about uh, explaining and showing you these fabulous and historic and rare bells that Alabama has, and especially the ones here at Tuskegee, which are very special indeed. We'll begin our discussion of historic tower clocks and bells in Alabama uh, by uh, exploring tower clocks themselves. First question is, what is a tower clock? Here's an example of a tower clock from a Seth Thomas tower clock catalog of 1911. We've got an illustration on the left here that shows a cutaway section through a tower. And you can see uh, the actual clock movement is here in this chamber. It's a very complicated system, but the principle of how it works is actually very simple. Of course, this clock is what generates the actual time, the actual depiction of time on the clock dials. And when it becomes the hour, this clock has a mechanism that will strike the bell, which is located uh, above the clock. Sometimes the bell is located below the clock, but this uh, clock movement um, system uh, was, was predominant in America and still is. It was driven by weights, or known as uh, gravity driven or escapement gravity driven. And uh, we look at the example on the right of a Seth Thomas number 16 um, striking tower clock. These are marvelous machines. If you'll notice, the pendulum is a massive, uh, massive piece of equipment. The pendulum alone weighs upwards of uh, over 135 to up to 175 pounds. Um, this this uh, is made for a single bell up to almost 3,000 pounds. And uh, the, these were beautiful machines. I've seen many of them in my research and, and travels and into towers. And uh, they're just phenomenal. So that's a tower clock. The reason I showed you this slide is because most people don't know what, it think, what a, the inside of a tower looks like. And it's, my impression was at one time that it was all like a, full of gears and sprockets and huge gears and sprockets that you could, you know, had to watch out for, but that's, that's not the case at all. Um, and uh, these were, um, the way these clocks are made, even here, this one from 1911, is very similar in principle to the clocks that were made even back uh, during the age uh, approaching the, the end of the Renaissance. Wonderful, wonderful uh, um, invention and technology. Let's explore the tower clock of the Macon County Courthouse. This is a great example. It's right here in our dear Tuskegee. First, I want to talk, just talk about the architecture of the courthouse. We have in Tuskegee a fabulous, fabulous, in terms of architecture, a courthouse. This was designed by the Atlanta architect J.W. Galuk. Uh, it was built in a very Richardsonian Romanesque style, uh, circa 1905. It re this uh, courthouse replaced an earlier antebellum courthouse, which had uh, a steel tower in front of it that had a bell mounted on the, on the uh, top of the tower. That same bell is now up in the top of this clock tower. Uh, it was cast in 1897. So we know that was the very bell that was in the previous courthouse. 
Uh, but uh, once again, just referring to J.W. Galuk, J.W. Galuk is associated with Tompkins Hall here on campus. He's credited with designing or having a part in the design of Tompkins Hall. Now, I'm very careful in saying that because I dare not take anything away from our beloved uh, Robert R. Taylor. So I will uh, uh, place that assertion uh, squarely with the scholars who know better uh, and know best, but his name does appear in the entries of uh, historical records. And I would say that, that possibly he was uh, uh, an assistant, possibly. Uh, there's a lot to mine in, in this type of research. And here indeed is the clock of the Macon County Courthouse. I have three uh, photos here for you. Uh, the first one on the left is of the clock itself. That clock is a, a uh, Seth Thomas 15B uh, movement. Very similar to the one that we saw in the example which described uh, what a tower clock was. Uh, wonderful machine, still, still works. It's electrified now. Still has the original manufacturer's plate right here that uh, shows the, the stamp, the, uh, the uh, item number, and, uh, and the, the, uh, the company signature of the Seth Thomas clock, uh, clock Company. The lower slide on the right is a picture of what the clock dial room looks like from the inside. Very, very uh, unique and surprising. And then referring once again to the bell that's in the top, this is a bell that was cast by the Charles Stevens Bell Company out of Hillsboro, Ohio. It's a 40 inch in diameter bell. It weighs probably a, uh, 700 to 900 pounds and it's made of steel alloy. Now these bells, the steel alloy bells were not bronze, but Charles Stevens Bell created such a unique metallurgical recipe that they sounded very close to bronze in some respects. And so that's why they became popular throughout America. And they were very affordable bells. They were less expensive than bronze bells. Let's explore the campus tower clock and bells of Tuskegee, Tuskegee University, our dear mother Tuskegee. Let's begin with Whitehall. Whitehall was uh, designed and built in 1909 uh, by our, our beloved uh, Robert R. Taylor, Robert Robinson Taylor, the Tuskegee architect, the first and um, uh, I wanna say outstanding campus architect, designed Whitehall. Originally, Whitehall had a small, I wanna say it was more of a, uh, a folly type of ornamental, I'll just say architectural feature on top of Whitehall. And uh, the, uh, the donors who donated the clock wanted to do a completely different clock tower. So Robert R. Taylor uh, did this, did the design assisted by uh, W.T. Bailey, the other, one of the many others of the, uh, the, the cadre of Tuskegee architects. Uh, a lot of people believe that Robert Taylor did the design and W.T. Bailey did the uh, technical drawings, but no one really knows. But this was uh, added to Whitehall in 1913 and it's beautiful. Uh, the, the exterior is clad completely of copper. It's aged beautifully, it has beautiful patina on top, that's where the copper has really aged and shows that marvelous green, bluish, polychromatic quality. Now the clock that was originally in Whitehall, it's no longer there now, was, was a version uh, from the E. Howard uh, Clock Company in Boston, Massachusetts, and it was a quarter strike uh, tower clock like this. I think what we're seeing here in this, this is from the catalog of E. Howard. This is a uh, probably a front and back photograph showing both sides of the clock. And uh, if you'll notice the difference between this clock and the previous one in the Macon County Courthouse, 
This one is able to strike uh, more than one bell. And that's why it's called a quarter strike. And on the right is a depiction. Uh, this is the author's depiction from a journey up into White Hall several years ago. This is what the bells look like in the tower even now. They're hung from an iron frame. There are four bells so they can strike the Westminster and uh, strike on the quarter hour as well as striking on the hour. Now these bells were made by the Clinton H. Manili Bell Company of Troy, New York in 1912. It actually has that inscription on the waist of the bell on each bell. And they're different size bells. And of course the largest bell is the one that struck uh, for the hour. But uh, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, sad that we no longer have uh, in White Hall this marvelous E. Howard clock. And incidentally, to make the connection to the bells, the bells were ordered by the E. Howard Watch and Clock Company uh, late in 1912. So that tracks exactly with the date of Whitehall, tracks exactly with the connection between this clock and these bells. Let's look now at the Chambliss Children's House, designed by Robert R. Taylor and Lewis H. Persley, who associated with Robert R. Taylor for, uh, for projects. Uh, and they were, you could call them partners in practice. Uh, this, this building was designed in uh, 1929 to 1930. I think that uh, there was a, a record of the drawings being done in early 1929. And so uh, this is a beautiful expression of a Palladian idea here uh, in the, uh, the front portico here, the entrance, uh, typical of Taylor and Persley as well, who had a very, he was a very able designer, a very able uh, uh, architectural detailer. Now the Chambliss Hall does have a bell. It's up here in the bell coat. That's what this structure is called. And uh, they, you can see that the bell is there, probably just like it was when it was originally built. And here's an enlarged photo of the bell. It was cast in 1929 by the Clinton H. Manili Bell Foundry of Troy, New York. Now there is an inscription on the bell it says the Chambliss Children's House. The, ha the, ha the, the word house is written on the other side, 1929. Uh, I'll explain more about Clinton H. Manili Bells uh, as we go along in, in the presentation, but uh, they are very special bells. And in fact, the, the bell that's in Sanford Hall at Auburn in the, the Sanford Tower clock bell was made by Clinton H. Manili. And it's a monster bell. It's, uh, it's about a ton. So uh, this one is a smaller version, but those bells were always quality, beautifully done, and beautiful sound. Here we have Tuskegee's Thrasher Hall and the bell of Thrasher Hall. Uh, when most people see Thrasher Hall, I wonder if they see this bell sitting out front on the pedestal. Here's an enlarged shot of it. But this is, let me, <laughs> this, this is, I can't emphasize this enough. This is a very special bell. And I'm going to explain more as we go on in our presentation and you'll see the connection. But this bell has a lineage to Paul Revere. No, no doubt about it. Um, it was cast in 1894 and very likely is one of the last bells of that foundry that was made. So this is a, a wonderful and incredible bell. Very, very unique, and I would say invaluable, priceless. Uh, the bell is unique to Tuskegee in two ways. The first, the first way it's unique to Tuskegee and special is because of the Revere legacy. Uh, also, I would say the first reason, <laughs> there isn't really no second reason, is because this was a bell specifically for Tuskegee. And we see this on the inscription. This was a gift to the Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute from Northern Friends on April 19th, 1894. 
That's actually inscribed on the bell. That means that it was the gift, as it says, from Northern Friends to Tuskegee. We don't know much beyond this at this point, except that, that this was something that was very, very unique and special as a gift. Inscription on the other side of the bell is a quote from Emerson. Put your creed into your deed, nor speak with double tongue. Isn't that wonderful? And so, so rich. I mean, you know, the quote from Emerson, the, uh, the uh, specificity, <laughs> I got away with saying that, of this being uniquely for Tuskegee, a gift from Northern Friends. What a special, special treasure this is. Here we begin to understand why the Blake Bell is important to Tuskegee. When we look at the Revere, Hooper, and Blake Bells of Alabama, let me begin by saying, when we see a, a moniker like this, Revere, Hooper, Blake, it means one thing. All were connected to Revere. So what you could say in short, in a shorthand sense, is that these are all in the Revere family of bells. These bells are not original Revere bells. Only these are. But these are very much in the family. And I'll explain. We, we need to see the um, connection of Paul Revere to Alabama to begin with. Let's look at Paul Revere. Paul Revere's first bell was cast in 1792, and he cast it for his church, which was the New Brick Meeting House uh, in Boston. The story goes that the, the church bell <coughs> in his church uh, cracked, and the church leadership wanted to take it down and send it to England. And Paul Revere got word of this, and he, uh, he went to the, the, the vicar of the church, and he said, uh, I wish you would let me have a chance to try to cast this bell. He saw in this uh, opportunity that he could try his hand at casting bells. And, uh, and th they gave approval for him to do so. So Paul Revere got with Colonel Aaron Hobart, who is at that time the premier bellcaster in America. There were only a few, very few people cast bells in America at this time. And under the apprenticeship of Colonel Aaron Hobart, Revere learned and, and, and studied and, and then cast this bell that you see in this, this photograph here, which was very kindly sent by the people of St. James Episcopal Church in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And it was a good casting. The first, his very first bell was a very, it was a good casting. The sound was decent. And um, he did a good job, a very decent job. One thing that is said about his early bells though, uh, and I might have been the vicar of his church at that time, or maybe another one in the same denomination who made the remark, um, we may all be glad we may all be very glad for Mr. Revere's ability to make a bell, but we may not all be glad for the sound of them. <laughs> so uh, he, he, did, he did a decent job, and he only got better over time. Alabama's only Revere bell, the one, only one in the state that was cast by Revere and has the, the inscripted name of Revere on the bell is at the First United Methodist Church in Tuscaloosa. This bell was cast in 1828 for the church, specifically for the church, and it was a gift of Samuel St. John Jr. and Joshua B. Levins of Mobile. No one knows why they gave the bell, even to this day. There's been speculation, but there's no official record. The, the church doesn't really know concretely uh, how this came to be, but Nonetheless, it was a gift at that time and a beautiful bell. Um, unfortunately, 
uh, nearly uh, practically a hundred years later when the, that church was, the first church was being torn down, um, the uh, pastor at that time, uh, Claire Purcell, was looking around the church grounds and he noticed a pile of debris over uh, next to where uh, the church was being dismantled. And in this pile of debris was this bell. And Bishop Purcell, later became Bishop Purcell, had the great sense and intuition to save this bell. He, he really understood this bell and what it represented and who, who made it and so forth. And so he ordered the bell removed from the pile of debris and cleaned up and eventually rehung for service in the, uh, uh, for the church again. Marvelous story. And we all are indebted to Bishop Claire Purcell for, for doing this uh, back in 1920. Um, I'm so fortunate, I feel, I had a chance to climb into the tower and to see this bell firsthand, to look at it, and, uh, uh, and I may be very careful to say this, I don't want to ever make anything uh, idle, but uh, I was so in awe of this bell, I had to put my hands on it. I mean, just had to do it, because if you think about the hands that touched it in 1828, when it was being cast, um, William Blake, who I believe supervised or maybe actually made this bell. He was the master bell caster for Paul Revere. So it was just too, too much to resist and I, I gave in. <laughs> so, uh, but wonderful, wonderful bell, beautiful sound, so much to tell. Now we come to Henry N. Hooper and his story in, in, um, in the Revere legacy. Henry Hooper was the company agent for the Revere Company. He knew nothing of bells and casting or making things. He was the money man. He was the one who provided them with the sales, marketing, um, and he's the reason that that company really grew and grew and grew as it did. Of course, this picture of him on, <clears throat> on the right, very, very striking man, striking appearance, very dapper. Um, the picture on the left is a drawing by Winslow Homer for the, uh, for the Harper's Weekly edition of, uh, uh, I believe that was from 1860. Yeah, May, May 26, 1860. And uh, I won't make the audience guess, but uh, I believe that Henry Hooper is here. I believe that's him. It could be no other in my view. That's conjectural, it can be debated, but uh, but I think one thing he was good at was inspiring people. Um, somehow, when he took, took a hold of the company, he did wonders with it. The sad part about his acquisition of the Revere Company was that it was in a very uh, hotly contested legal battle with the grandson of uh, Paul Revere. Uh, it seemed like at the time the Revere Company just didn't have the resources to continue like they were. Hooper did. He had, um, because of his success and knowledge of, fin of, of finances, he was just able to um, acquire the foundry. And uh, I think there was probably a little bit of bad blood between him and uh, the Revere grandson um, after that. But there's a lot that we don't know. But we do know that uh, it seemed that the principal uh, Foundry personnel stayed on. They stayed with Hooper, uh, you know, through his, his time of having the foundry, which was uh, until his death in 1868. Here in Alabama, <clears throat> we have examples of Hooper Bells. This one is the 1859 Hooper Bell of the uh, former Raymer Baptist Church. Now it's known as Sampy Memorial Baptist Church in Raymer. And it's a beautiful bell. But you can see, if you look at the yoke and see certain things about the bell, you can see the similarity. It's a Revere bell. Practically, it's the same. And even on his business stationery, uh, Henry Hooper referred to Revere above his name. So this was a, a, an interesting uh, motif. 
Henry Hooper had a lot to do <coughs> with the state capitol. Um, the connection here um, in the story of the state capitol, I, I'm going to get to the uh, uh, to the surprise moment here in a, in a moment, but I need to tell you the history of the capital. <clears throat> of course, our present capital here in Alabama is the second capital. The first capital burned, and after <clears throat> this capital was rebuilt to its present form, um, there was no clock, no clock on the capital anywhere. And the people of Montgomery wanted a town clock. So they got together and they petitioned the legislature and um, the legislature agreed <clears throat> and passed legislation in February of 1852 to enable the city of Montgomery to be able to give and donate a clock to be placed atop the Capitol. By the way, this is, uh, ours is the only state capital in America that has a clock. There is no clock on any other uh, state capital in America. And here we see Henry Hooper's contribution. Many people don't know this. Uh, you have to get on the steps of the Archives Building and look across to see it, but there is a bell on the roof of the Capitol. <clears throat> and it's the Capitol clock bell. And um, it's a huge bell. Uh, it came with the clock when they, they put the, the clock, the movement of the clock and the bell came together. At least that's what, that is what is believed. Here's a close-up shot of it. This clock was cast in 1850. However, remember, the legislation enabling the placement of a, of a clock atop the Capitol was 1852. So, there's a bit of a mystery as to where this bell came from. Um, my speculation is that it was a bell that he had that was not sold, <clears throat> might have been a bell that was refused for non-payment, who knows. But uh, it came with the clock, and the clock was, uh, the, clock, the model of the clock is around 1854. So you see there's still a lot to do research on here in this area. But uh, former clock keepers of the Capitol State Clock said that this bell approached the size of the Liberty Bell. And there, that's a very valid statement. Here we have a picture of the clock itself. Our State Capitol Clock is here. Uh, unfortunately, this clock right now is in the basement of the Capitol. It was removed and replaced with a digital system. But what it looked like at one time was this clock, which is found to reside in the tower of the Jamaica Plain Unitarian Universalist Church in Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts. What a beautiful machine. I mean, this is the way that these clocks looked when they were <clears throat> made. There was a lot of artistry, a lot of mechanical, uh, just mechanical uh, artistry, design, even in the parts, the moving parts, they all had, a, even though they were functional, <clears throat> there was a certain aesthetic. And this clock shows clearly <clears throat> the degeneration of time and not really being maintained. It was electrified, which hurt this clock uh, quite a bit because all of its essential parts were thrown away. Now we come to William Blake. William Blake is the successor of the foundry after Henry Hooper, who succeeded after Revere, obviously. William Blake the significance of William Blake was that he was, <clears throat> he was the master bellcaster for the Revere's. When Revere was in business, he, he was the, the master bellcaster for Revere and for Hooper and then for himself as he acquired the foundry upon 
Henry Hooper's death in 1868. Now, I'm going to conjecture that this is William Blake standing next to Hooper in an enlargement of the uh, Harper's Weekly illustration by Winslow Homer. One important fact about um, William Blake that stands out in the annals of history in records was that he was a musician and he had a musical ear. He was known as an incredible mechanic, meaning that he could do anything in related to foundry arts, uh, you know, fixing things. He was somewhat of an inventor probably. Uh, so he was gifted in the technical and mechanical arts, but he also was a musician with an incredible musical ear. And this is the reason that the Revere Bells began to sound musical, was because of William Blake. They would have still sounded decent if it was not for William Blake, but William Blake made the difference. So you could say Revere founded the foundry, Cooper made it bigger, and Blake made the bell sweeter. That's why you could summate that. Here we have the Gainesville Presbyterian Church, built around 1838-39. Obviously, it's in the style of a New England meeting house because that whole town of Gainesville was started by people from New England. And should it be no accident that when they were going to hang bells in their towers that they went back to New England, back to Boston to find such. I will have a little more word on the Gainesville um, Presbyterian Church in, a, uh, in, in shortly. Uh, but I want to mention that, that uh, the Blake Bell here of Thrasher Hall, once again, this is a photograph of Thrasher Hall from, uh, I guess, the turn of the century. Um, but you, what I wanted to point out was you can see the bell here. You can kind of see the rope wheel, and then there's some little hint of the bell up in the cupola. So that was where it resided for the greater part of this building's life. Um, I think it would be a great thing if it could be restored back to the cupola when the building is restored. Um, that's, a, that's a proposal. <laughs> uh, we, we'll see. Maybe at some point in time we'll see. Okay, this is relating back to the Greensville uh, Presbyterian Church. And this is what's so remarkable about um, that church. That church originally had a bell cast by Hooper in 1839. Uh, it's long gone because it cracked um, in 1880 and it was taken down and sent back to the foundry to be replaced by another bell, which at that time was cast by Blake. William Blake cast the bell here on the right. And it was a larger bell, and supposedly they added silver dollars in to the, uh, to the mix for a sweeter sound. So the Gainesville Presbyterian Church had, had two, um, or I should say still has one artifact, but had a previous uh, product from the Hooper Foundry. So they're unique in that, in that wise. And here's another picture of, a couple of pictures showing the bell of the Gainesville Presbyterian Church. Um, you can see the similarity to it, uh, to the one at Thrasher. And they still have the rope wheel, which is, which is here on the, uh, on the right. That's the rope wheel. Here's a, a little bit of the bell from the bottom. And uh, these photographs were taken by Katie Magoo Smith of Livingston, Alabama, and, and she and her mother braved this tower and uh, um, I was told a couple of owls. One owl swooped on them uh, while they were in the tower, so I'm very appreciative for these photographs. 
Now, a lot of people don't know that the Liberty Bell has a connection to Alabama, actually more than, in, in more than one sense. Let's talk about that now, the Liberty Bell and its connection to Alabama. We need to begin with Jay Wilbank and his connection with Independence Hall. In discussing uh, Jay Wilbank and his connection to Independence Hall, uh, I'd like to show you an advertisement for his business on the left. And uh, this is around 1830, uh, where he was advertising in the newspaper for being a bell founderman and casting bells. And of course on the right is the Liberty Bell cast in 1852 by the famous uh, Whitechapel Bell Foundry in London. Uh, now, <clears throat> the connection of J. Wilbank to the Liberty Bell is amazing. And here's the story. Uh, in 1828, um, the, uh, the government there in Philadelphia commissioned John Wilbank to cast a new bell for Independence Hall and to take down the old State House bell, which is what the Liberty Bell was known as. And they said, we'll pay you $400 to, for drayage, that means to cart it away, but we want you to cast a bell in its place and we're paying you to take down the bell also and do what you want to with it, basically. Well, John Wilbank said to the city fathers, he said, wait a minute, that's not nearly enough money <laughs> to do what I need to do to take this bell away. So he got into a disagreement with them, which wound up in court and wound up in the end with the judge giving John Wilbank the Liberty Bell but also ordering him to give it to the city of Philadelphia on permanent loan. So John Wilbank is the man who reluctantly saved the Liberty Bell. That's his legacy. Now there are records and other hints and indications that he may have appreciated what the bell stood for while he was taking it down or shortly after. But um, uh, it's, it's, it, there's so much to tell here about this story, but that is his connection to the Liberty Bell, and, and we need to see his connection to Alabama in this. And here's his Alabama connection. In Florence, Alabama, when their first church was built in 1824, uh, they, uh, I'm sure they had to pay for the church. After building it, it took some time, but they, they have a bell cast by John Wilbank, cast in 1835, seven years after he saved the Liberty Bell. This is in Florence, Alabama, right here in our, uh, in our state. And uh, this is the, uh, the church today. It looks just like it did in this photograph from 1898. And it is a wonderful bell, amazing. Here's a, here's a picture of it and a drawing of it. Um, as, as we know, it's still intact. It still looks original. It still has the original yoke and mountings and, and everything. Um, and so this is right here in Alabama at the First Presbyterian Church. John Wilbank or J. Wilbank bells are extremely rare extremely rare. It is hard to find a, a bell by John Wilbank anywhere. And uh, this is a very, very, very important treasure for the, uh, the people of the First Presbyterian Church and the state of Alabama. The second Wilbank bell is located in Greensboro, Alabama at the Greensboro Presbyterian Church. This one was cast in 1841. And um, anyone traveling through Greensboro can go and see this bell. You can get out of your car and go over and touch it. It's sitting in a stand, a brick mounting stand outside the church, and it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. It does have, ironically, a small crack right here. 
I think that's just coincidental, but, but anyway, Alabama has two historic treasures connected to the man who saved the Liberty Bell. I think that's absolutely fabulous. Also, the Liberty Bell came through Alabama. Not just once, but twice. And here's the schedule. This is the first time that the Liberty Bell traveled by train away from Philadelphia. It went from Philadelphia to New Orleans in 1885 to the, <coughs> the uh, 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 Cotton Exposition uh, Centennial there in uh, New Orleans. Uh, we can look at the schedule here on the right and we can see that it, uh, it came through in Alabama, it came through Birmingham, Montgomery, and Mobile before it came to New Orleans. Now, the chief mission of this, uh, of this exposition and specifically the Liberty Bell coming and traveling this route from the north to the south was to pr promote healing between the north and the south after the Civil War, which it did. The response was incredible. The enthusiasm uh, of everyone in every city seeing this bell was just amazing. So this was a, a very much a red letter day for Alabama when the Liberty Bell came through. I'd like to point out that um, for the stop in Birmingham, it's listed as 3 p.m. Actually, the Liberty Bell got there at 4.30 in the afternoon. Got there an hour and a half late. But it came to a crowd that almost besieged it. I mean, they had to have police force, tremendous number of uh, police uh, there keeping the crowd from the Liberty Bell. It was on a, uh, a special platform, a special platform car with uh, uh, police from the uh, city of Philadelphia guarding it. Uh, it was estimated around, I think it was thousands, 2,000 people, the crowd that gathered at the uh, terminal station there in Birmingham. People were on the roof of, uh, of the train sheds. They were on the roofs of boxcars. They were surrounding the tracks. It was a kind of a nice uh, mayhem in a way, if you, if you will. And, um, and they had a small ceremony, and of course, dignitaries spoke and gave speeches. And uh, then the train went on to Montgomery. But it was a tremendous event, and, uh, and not very much uh, in, the, in, the, in the know in Alabama's uh, historical consciousness. So uh, the Liberty Bell came through Alabama. It came through these cities to New Orleans, and then when it came back, it came back through uh, uh, Tuscaloosa and Birmingham, I think, on its way to Atlanta. Here we have in Alabama a replica of the Liberty Bell. Uh, this is one that's located on the grounds of the Capitol, our state Capitol. It's an exact replica, uh, sans the crack. Uh, a lot of people ask, is there a crack? <laughs> no, no, there's not a crack but it's a wonderful reproduction. It was made by the Picard foundry in France who have been making bells for centuries. They, and I'm so impressed the way that they signed this bell. They just signed it simply on the back in very small letters, Picard, France. Beautiful, beautiful work that they did. And you can go see this bell anytime. It's on the south lawn of the uh, state capitol in the Avenue of Flags. So you can come and see this bell anytime. Now we come to the section of Alabama history of the Civil War and the Civil War bells of Alabama. These are bells that have unique stories about the being in the conflict in one sense or another, of surviving, it's of even bells that are not pictured but uh, impacted the ones that, that are there now um, because they were lost. They were lost uh, in, uh, because of the Civil War. The first one is the Church of the Nativity in, in Huntsville, Huntsville, Alabama. It, originally, it had a bell, a bronze bell, 
that was uh, cast in 1859 and cost $250. That's what's in the church's records, that it did cost $250. However, 1859 to 1861, <laughs> it, it went off for service in the Confederacy and it was melted down for munitions in Mississippi. Now, the bell that's on the right is its replacement bell, cast in 1865 by the Naylor Vickers Bell Foundry of Sheffield, England. Uh, and this bell is a steel bell, it's not bronze, and it is so loud. It is so incredibly loud. I w I'm glad I wasn't in the tower when it went off, but um, I was in the foyer of the tower and it was loud in the, in the foyer, let me tell you. Um, but uh, this bell is the only one that I came across, this nativity steel bell, that was cast with the numbers 186. In all of my seven years of researching, uh, researching bells in Alabama, I never saw a bell cast with a 186 number because of the Civil War. Uh, those, those bell foundries were making cannons by that time. So uh, th and this one being from England in 1865 ma makes the difference. That's why they could cast it in 1865, probably after the war was over. This bell recently became famous locally. Um, sadly, this church, First Presbyterian Church of Wetumpka, was obliterated by the uh, recent tornado of last year. Um, and, uh, and, and, and glory to, to God for, and thanks to, to God for the church being rebuilt now. It's, it's actually very much on the way to being um, uh, completely rebuilt. They recently rehung this bell in the tower. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful bell, has a beautiful sound. Uh, this bell has been through a lot. This bell survived that tornado and uh, when it was recovered in the debris, when they pulled it out of the debris, it rang. It had a beautiful peal, beautiful sound. Before that, it almost, you know, it was um, in a hurricane, but then its Confederate and Civil War connection was that this congregation offered it to the Confederacy during the Civil War. But can you believe it? The, uh, the powers that be of the Confederacy rejected it. They said their furnaces were full and they had no need of the bell at this time. Isn't that amazing? But this bell was cast in 1857 by the Manili West Troy Bell Foundry uh, there in, in New York. And uh, it's a marvelous bell. Let me give a word about this quality that you see on bells. This polychromatic film that covers these bells, it's known as patina. The patina of a bell is everything in terms of its value. Sometimes, I'd like to say well-meaning bell vendors and bell companies offer to come to churches and polish their bells and make them look cleaner, you know, more presentable as it were and so forth. Uh, a bell should never be polished. A bronze bell especially should never be polished. The patina is, is the, it is the history, it is the value, it, it's everything. And when you remove it, not only are you removing the history, you're also changing the tone of the bell because it's called skinning the bell. And uh, I just pause on this slide to explain that. Um, the best loved bells are green and blue and bronze and all colors. Uh, in between in the color spectrum as that beautiful uh, oxidation process takes place. Uh, and that's what you want. Now, civil rights bells of Alabama. I want to tell you, I was so excited when I did these bells because of the significance tied to these locations tied to um, such history, such incredible sacrifice 
during the civil rights struggle where these bells many times were silent witnesses and their the stories are amazing here we have the church bell of the old ship ame zion church in montgomery it was cast by the van dusen and tift bell foundry also known as the buckeye bell foundry cast in 1876 so it's a it's a centennial type of bell 1876 now this church is so beautiful it's one been one of my favorite churches ever since i came to live in montgomery and the record or at least what's recorded is was uh, this phase of the church the current phase of the church was designed by an architect named jim alexander but the church itself the church proper uh, was a gift from the Methodist Church to this congregation, and it was actually rolled from the Methodist Church site to the present site and put up on the, uh, the foundations that, that, that they had built beforehand for it. And when it was en route down the street, rolling on logs, someone asked uh, one of the people involved in the moving, uh, someone called out and said, what are, what are you all doing there? And the response was from one of the one of the workers. Well, we're this is the old ship of Zion, and uh, we're we're moving. Now I may have done violence to the quote, but that was the gist of it. And uh, when they put the church there, uh, it was wooden. And then later on, they did this fabulous. Um, uh, Want to say additions and alterations to the church. I think it's one of the most proportionally correct churches uh, in, architecturally uh, that I've ever seen. So I'd like to learn more about Jim Alexander. I think he was a, a fabulous uh, architect. And, and by the way, this is just, uh, just to let you know uh, which tower is the bell in. Of course, nobody could guess that from looking at the slide, but it's here. And uh, it's a beautiful bell. Whenever you see if you're out and about and you see bells and towers and you see two bolts on top like this, that's a Buckeye bell. Always they have the two bolts. Here is the church bell of the First Baptist Church, uh, Ripley, Ripley Street, Montgomery. Uh, this is the church that was the refuge for the Freedom Riders in 1963, including Congressman John Lewis who was originally from Troy, Alabama. I did not know that until I think the early 2000s. I was sitting in a meeting and someone told, said that he was from Troy, Alabama. I never knew that before. I was so thankful I had a chance to meet him uh, several years ago and uh, at this church when there was, a, where there was a, um, an anniversary of a civil rights event and he was there and he signed the program for me and took time to speak with me. I was so impressed with him. Such a nice man, very kind and uh, very, uh, just, a, just a noble person and is. I uh, just think the world of him. Um, but this bell that's in the tower, uh, it's amazing when you see this and you begin to think, this bell was here and saw if it was a personified it saw everything that was going on uh, during the Freedom Riders tremendous trial and uh, that's that's so important I mean it's in civil rights history that is so important if we examine the bell alone the bell alone is amazing um, you can see cast into this bell is a scripture, peace on earth, goodwill to all men, taken from the Gospels. But it has the names of all the church deacons and the pastor here at the bottom. And here you can see it says pastor under his name. Now the bell has two dates on it, uh, 1911 and 1912, which is curious. Um, the, uh, I think the founder's date is 1912. It's for some reason, I believe that right over 
on the side there's here there's a, a date 1911 and that may have been what was written on the paper that they gave to the foundry to cast so it's very interesting but it's a beautiful bell it was made by Clinton H. Manili once again uh, of Troy New York and uh, it's a beautiful bell has a great sound it's in marvelous shape uh, just, just a, it's a wonder. I mean, these, these bells are just incredible. Here we have the church bell of the Mount Zion AME Zion Church. And uh, when I was writing my book, I was starting to include Mount Zion AME Zion Church as one of the churches that didn't have a bell. Not that they couldn't have a bell, but or did, you know, could never have a bell, but they didn't have one, but could, you know, in the future. And, uh, and I spoke with a gentleman named Mr. Charles P. Everett IV before I went to press, and he told me that they had taken the bell from their present church, which was a new church, and they had indeed put it back in the tower of the historic church. And I was so glad that I talked to him uh, because he sent me photographs. In fact, he sent me this photograph on the right. That's where they were taking it down from the, the quote, new church. And then they were taking it, you know, of course, back to the uh, historic church. And that, that caption here, the church bell, the Mount Zion AME Zion Church, Montgomery, coming home. Indeed, that's what it is. It was coming home. And this bell is a CS bell. I'm very sure it's a CS bell or a derivative, maybe cast by the National Bell Foundry. But it's a steel alloy bell, and they're, they're good bells. The 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, <clears throat> designed by Wallace Rayfield, Tuskegee University connection, the great architect Wallace Rayfield. Uh, astounding. Uh, who designed 16th Street Baptist Church. And let me say, you cannot say 16th Street without pausing because of the tragedy. Um, very, very sad, but very, very much a, a heartache in the national consciousness even today. Um, but uh, in the succeeding slide here, there, there's, uh, there's something positive. But, uh, but this is, I wanted to show uh, that the bell, the bell that was in the tower at the time was this one, was cast by the National Bell Foundry. Uh, the casting date is unknown, but most likely it was around the time that the church, uh, the church was designed and built. A lot of people don't know this, but the CS bells were sold by Sears and Roebuck. So it's very possible that this congregation bought this bell at, a, at Sears. That's very possible. Because Charles Stevens' bell uh, was uh, good at marketing too. <laughs> Here we have the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights March on Washington. This is actually one of my favorite slides in, in the presentation and in, in my book uh, of uh, President Obama uh, with the bell beside him uh, in uh, commemoration of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech and ringing that bell 50 times as our own Thrasher Hall bell was rung 50 times on that same day. I just will always appreciate President Obama and uh, the commemoration of, of that event and Dr. King and, and using that bell. I thought that was so so wonderful, just such a wonderful gesture and, and uh, a way to uh, punctuate and emphasize uh, in a very positive way the healing uh, for our land. Here we have the Brown Chapel AME Church and their church bell. Um, Brown Chapel AME Church designed and built in 1908 by A.J. Farley who is a tremendous architect like Jim Alexander. Unfortunately, we don't know enough about him. Um, but uh, of course, Brown Chapel is the, is the landmark starting point of the uh, 
Selma and Montgomery March in 1965. The church bell was cast by the McShane Bell Foundry of Baltimore, Maryland. It was cast in 1881. It's a beautiful bell. And I will show you, it is in this tower. And um, if the audience will let me, uh, you had to be a little bit of a worm to get up in that tower because they built two floors with hatches that were a little off from each other. But somehow I made it, <laughs> so I'm thankful. Um, the Bell's inscription, McShane Bell Foundry, Henry, Henry McShane and Company, Baltimore, Maryland, 1881. Uh, he was an Irish immigrant and he apprenticed under Joshua Register, who was also a famous uh, bell maker of his day. Now, when we were together, I was together with Pastor Leotis Strong in his office after I came down from the tower. Uh, there was a burning question I had for Pastor Strong, and I, I, I asked him, I said, do, if you don't mind me asking this, I said, do you know if this bell rang during the Civil Rights March? And he responded to me and said, he said, you know, I, I don't know. And he paused for a moment and he said, but I know someone who might. And he picked up the phone and he called one of his parishioners who was there in the Civil Rights March. Her name, was, uh, her name is Joyce O'Neill Parrish. And over the phone by speaker, she explained to us about the history of bell ringing at the Brown Chapel Church and who rang the bell, Mr. Edward Davis, who was the church section, and he rang it uh, on, the, on the Sunday, uh, between Sunday school and the worship service. And she confirmed that indeed on that very day, he did ring that bell. So the Brown Chapel AME Church bell was rung on Bloody Sunday. Isn't that remarkable? I mean, it gives even more significance um, to that bell because it rang on that historic day. I want to say carefully, historic, tragic, but historic. Historic because of what has followed, but tragic um, in every sense of the word. And I say that so carefully uh, to my audience, but indeed it is historic because of, uh, of what it has accomplished for us now and even onward. I close with, with these thoughts to you. I thank you for joining me. In reflection of these 200 years of Alabama's history of which tower clocks and bells have played no small part, we must cherish the gifts of time that our ancestors gave us for in cherishing them, we better understand their time and so in turn also better understand our own time and in turn help those ahead of us better understand their time. And I thank you.